These are the masks of the Gere. They have come out of their sacred dwellings to bless and come to the aid of their people, to dance and display their power and their magic, to strengthen the faith and tradition. The ritual drum sound in the village of Betiguazon in the west of the Ivory Coast in Western Africa. In the language of percussion, they broadcast the rhythms identifying the different families and clans, telling them to come to the village square. The masks have arrived, and soon they will begin to dance. These are the real institutions which order, legislate, and codify the social life of the different ethnic groups that live in the region in the west of the Ivory Coast. Each one belongs to a different family. Some are very old and only appear on very special occasions. There are masks that only come out every five years, ten years, or even fifty. They are the representation of the protective spirits revealed in dreams. Their importance can be seen from the way in which they are decorated and the cortege of the initiated that accompanies them to lead them and take care of them. Before coming out, they must perform complex ceremonies at which they sacrifice animals in offering. The people both respect and fear them. From them, they gain strength and spiritual peace, but they avoid any accidental physical contact. If the mask does not give permission, no one apart from the initiated may touch them. There are masks of justice, of wisdom, warrior masks, satirical masks, and so on. Each one serves a specific need. Their dance is always spectacular. That is how they demonstrate that the power of their magic comes from the other world. Only the initiated know who has been chosen by the family chief to make the mask dance. Before putting on the clothes and the carved wooden mask, he goes into a profound trance which will last until he returns. Once it has come out, each mask must return to its secret dwelling place within a certain time of between two and four days. Before it is again put away, the obligatory sacrifices and rituals must be performed. The assembled people are moved by the demonstrations of strength and skill. They believe only the spirits can do these things. The clan chiefs preside over the ceremony, observing attentively. From time to time, they give orders to the initiated for the mass to do something specific. In this region of the Ivory Coast, there are still ancient jungles such as the Thai jungle and leafy forests which are home to different ethnic branches of the Mande group. The most characteristic of these are the Dan, who are related to the Gere. Their villages are very distant from each other. They do not form a large community, but rather isolated groups which only come together in exceptional circumstances or to defend themselves against some common threat. The circular houses are covered with a large conical pointed roof made with palm leaves and straw, which is a very efficient defense against the heavy rains of this region. The Dan women are in charge of the domestic chores, but they also play a very important social role. They are organized into secret societies, which have a decisive influence on the community and have their own masks. However, the women are not allowed to hide their faces, but only transform them using paint. Each village is governed by the Council of Ancients, which always dictates the rules of the society, jealously guards the secrets of the community, 
and makes sure the traditional laws, the gore, are obeyed. In this region of the Ivy Coast, from the time the young men are initiated, they form part of what is called the Gaul, the fundamental law which is the link between human existence and the divine spirit of the cosmos. Many huts are decorated with domestic motifs and clan and esoteric symbols related to the Gaul. This is a clear influence from the crew, a large ethnic group in the south. The tradition was brought here by the Gede, who are very closely related to the Dan. A great part of the mythology of the Dan is born in the heart of the jungle, in these labyrinthine forests teeming with life where their deities live and where nature and magic melt into one. The Dan have always respected and venerated their natural surroundings as something sacred, as it is the indisputable genesis of their cosmogony. In the interior of this green world, we find the bridges of the spirits. These are not the work of man. The supernatural beings of the forest themselves build these bridges to make it easier for the men who live here to move through the forest. Hundreds of lianas, the resistant living limbs of the jungle, are woven together in the dead of the night by the spirits. At dawn, a new bridge connects the opposing banks of a river or crosses a deep ravine. No one knows how or when they are built. But for them, they are sacred because they are made with lianas and everything that comes from the jungle is revered. That is why they take their shoes off before crossing, as a mark of respect. The chief of the secret society of the initiated responsible for the spiritual welfare of the people is also the guardian of the bridge. He will decide when they must stop using it. No bridge lasts longer than a year because the lianas lose their elasticity and become fragile and liable to break. Then they are destroyed. At dawn, the people come to the river and see that the bridge has disappeared, just as mysteriously as it appeared. The wise men then meet with the initiated to invoke the spirits and ask them for another bridge. Everything in the bridges comes from nature. There are no nails, ropes or screws, just lianas and trunks in a work of great skill. Only the initiates know how and when the bridge is built. The spiritual chief, who is also in charge of making the sacrifices and offerings, assigns and supervises the work. During these days, no one who has not been initiated may approach the area or enter the forest. They work in a state of trance possessed by the powerful spirits of the jungle. When the lianas are ready, the tom-tom sounds out until nightfall to warn everyone. If a woman or anyone not belonging to the secret society came close and saw them at work, they would be killed instantly. That night, the people remain in their houses. No one dares come out. The strange noises coming from the river terrify them. They know it is the powerful supernatural beings of the jungle working for them. At dawn, a new bridge will be consecrated. Legend tells that one day a group of warriors was escorting a princess and when they came to this region, they found a river they were unable to ford. The princess's son fell into the water. The current was very strong and carried him off. As the princess screamed out in desperation, a tree on the riverbank fell into the water, stretching out its branches towards the child, who grabbed hold of them and was able to reach safety. This was the first bridge the spirits gave to the inhabitants of the forest. A 
Among the Dan, education is a long process which only ends with death. By accepting responsibilities and taking on a role in life, they attain wisdom. The most important institution is the Gore, a secret society of the Leopard, which is responsible for ensuring justice and respect for the masks. They have the power to sanction and punish those who do not obey the traditional rules and codes. The Dan masks play a part in all areas of life. They serve as a bridge between the physical sphere of the village and the spiritual realm of the forest. Perhaps the most important is this one on stilts called Glegben. It is a mask of justice and greatly venerated. Whenever it comes out, an initiate chosen by the women's society accompanies it, imitating its movements. When there is some dispute between two families or a number of individuals in the community, the Glebgen mask imparts justice. Its decisions are always respected without question. Depending on how the mask is dressed and its colors, everyone knows from the moment it appears the mood of the spirit that day. Red signifies power, white serenity, black feathers ferocity, and the raffia hats strength. The spectators are deeply moved by these displays of balance and skill. For them, these movements are refutable evidence of the powerful magic of the other world. Further south by the national park of the ancient jungle of Tai, we find the Ubi, the painter people. They are a subgroup of the crew originating in nearby Liberia, and like these, they feel the need to express their feelings in paint. The facades of their houses are decorated with paintings showing scenes from daily life religious deities, forest animals, and abstract concepts of magic influence. The women are responsible for the household chores and looking after the children. The base of the Ubi's diet is cereals, rice, fish and meat from hunting and domesticated animals. The oil they use for cooking is obtained by crushing the fruit of the makori in a mortar, then boiling the resulting paste. The oldest members still wear their headdresses of panther teeth. Hunting is now restricted by the National Park authorities, but these people have traditionally been great hunters, who achieved their greatest dignity when they killed their first panther. Much of the Ubi mythology revolves around this feline. Apart from the daily chores, the women occupy a very important position in the social structure of the Ubi. As in the majority of the 60 or so different ethnic groups that live in the Ivory Coast, the women form secret societies which have a decisive influence in the village. In their meetings, which no man may attend, they deal with matters exclusive to women, though their attention has been centered on just one subject for some time now. In the main cities of the Ivory Coast, associations have been formed to eradicate the barbarous traditional practices, the mutilation of female sex organs. 
Periodically, women from these associations travel to the most remote villages to speak with the leaders of these secret societies and to try to convince them to abandon this custom. But it's not an easy task. They have to invoke the spirits and ask them about this delicate matter. The ones we see dressed in white are in a state of trance. Through them, the spirits express their opinion. Can the young women be initiated without subjecting them to the ablation of the clitoris? After a period in the forest where they learn the traditional codes, the esoteric secrets and the rules of how to be good wives and mothers, the young girls are taken to the house where the operation is performed and their clitoris removed. A year later, the initiated dance in the village square. The dances represent the teachings they have received. For example, these initiates show how to hunt a sorceress. Every movement, every tattoo, every gesture is loaded with symbolism. The leaders of the women's society preside over the dances. They dress in white because they are possessed by the protective spirits who have come to see if the young women have assimilated the process of initiation. It will be a long time before these savage sexual mutilations these women suffer are eradicated. It is calculated that at present over 60 million African women are affected by these practices. Female sexuality has, for as long as anyone can remember, been repressed in many ways all around the world. In Europe during the Middle Ages, women were forced to wear chastity belts and clitoridectomy was used as a drastic means to prevent masturbation. In Africa, the custom of genital mutilation has deep roots above all among the peoples of the Sahara region where the worst insult is to call someone son of a clitoris, implying he was conceived with pleasure. But here it is performed not simply on the orders of a suspicious husband as was the case with the chastity belt, but rather as a social symbol in which the women themselves participate. A woman who has not been initiated is not accepted by the community, is ignored and despised. Today, the greatest defenders of this practice are precisely the women who have undergone the operation, perhaps wanting the young women to suffer as they have. What is certain is that though the majority of African governments now recommend that these customs be abandoned, few dare to prohibit them. Genital mutilation of women continues, and they continue to dance to the sound of the drums before an archaic, repressive community which denies them the right to pleasure. Every village in the Ivory Coast has an area of the nearby forest where the spirits of their ancestors live. It is the sacred forest of each group, a place which is taboo for strangers. Here, the young men are brought to be initiated, circumcisions are carried out, they speak to the masks of wisdom, and justice is imparted. In the sacred forest of the Dan villages, the great Glewa mask dances to the frenetic rhythm of this primitive percussion orchestra.
the glower mask has tubular eyes and a large mouth. It is invoked to resolve problems of justice or important matters that affect the entire community. It is a mask of peace and for this reason is greatly revered. The women dance to worship it and to ask for its blessing. Its decisions are final. Any who disobey them are punished and die, poisoned by the executioners of the Gore Secret Society. Virtually all the forest on the Ivory Coast is burnt down once a year. To defend themselves from the animals that lie in waiting, ready to attack the villages, or in order to plant new crops, they set a light to the forest at the start of the dry season. The groups of hunters stalk the animals that flee from the fire. With sticks and hoes, they kill small animals such as squirrels, dwarf antelopes, snakes. They can all be eaten. It is an ancestral practice which has many negative aspects, though it does enrich the soil with phosphates, salts, and nutrients. After the fire, the forest starts to come back to life, while the hamatan, the dry, dusty wind from the north, envelops it in thick fog. The trees take on fantastical shapes, further reinforcing the belief in magic in this land of spells and sorcery, full of mystical and esoteric symbols. From out of this mysterious atmosphere of the jungle rises like a ghost the enormous dome of the Basilica of Yamasukuro. It is a copy of the Vatican, a colossal place of worship in the middle of the forest. 1,500 men working day and night took three years to build it. It was the dream of a devout man, the first president of the Ivory Coast, Félix Oufouet Bonnier, who ruled from the time of independence in 1963 until he died in 1993. The holy complex, which includes an exact copy of St. Peter's Square, including Bernini's colonnade, was completed in 1989 and consecrated by Pope John Paul II in 1990 during his third visit to this country. Oufoué Bagnier squandered a great part of his fortune on this titanic construction, which he then donated to the Vatican, the present owners of this basilica, now maintained by the Curia of Rome. 128 Doric columns, 30 meters in height, 7 hectares of marble brought from Italy, France and Spain, and 7,400 square meters of stained glass windows make up this monumental construction. But it's always empty because the people of this region have other beliefs, other gods to worship. In this drawing, we can appreciate the dimensions of this basilica on the right compared to the Vatican on the left. One of its 24 large stained glass windows represents the arrival of Jesus Christ in Jerusalem. Kneeling at the side of the donkey which carries Jesus, we can see Oufoué Boignet dressed as an apostle. On the left, wearing tunics from that time, the architect of the basilica, the Lebanese Pierre Fakouri, and his assistants welcome the Lord. There is sitting room for 7,000 people. Each pew has its own loudspeakers and air conditioning grill. 
Beneath the baldaquin, presiding over the gigantic presbyter, a cross of solid gold weighing 50 kilos, tries unsuccessfully to convince the Africans that Jesus Christ was just as poor as they are. Deepest ancient Africa is still to be seen everywhere. Though external influences are greater each day, tradition always remains behind any sign of modernity. The people continue to attend their own religious and cultural events such as this one, the Jongla. These young girls brushing past the knife blades without moving a single muscle are given by their families to be trained in this dangerous discipline. They believe they are possessed by a spirit which protects them and makes them brave enough to perform these displays. Each group of junglers moves from village to village putting on performances. When the girls are seven or eight, they leave the group and return home with the money they have earned. of the Mande country lies the land of the Sanufo, one of the ethnic groups of Africa that has best preserved its own culture. Agriculture is their main activity, though they also have cattle, above all goats and cows. Rice forms an important part of their diet. In these mortars, they separate the grain from the husk. It will then be stored in the granaries along with the millet and the maize. Sunufo villages tend to be large compared to those of other groups in the Ivory Coast. They are made up of groupings of different clans and lineages which form what we would call districts. In each one of them, there is a fetish house where they keep their masks and religious carvings. The decoration of the facade shows certain precepts and deities of the Poro, the fundamental law of the Senufo. Each fetish house is governed by a guardian who is normally an important dignitary of the clan's secret society. <laughs> Women are very important in Senufo society. Their power is comparable to that of the men, though less evident. The system of transmission of culture and tradition is matrilineal, which makes the women the head of the lineage. Even in the Poro, women occupy an extremely important place. For example, they play a vital part in the founding of new Sinzanga, or Poro schools, the head of which will be chosen by matrilineal line. In everyday life, the women are in charge of the domestic chores and looking after the children to whom they dedicate very special attention and affection. The tribal law dictates the state of affairs, above all up to the time they reach puberty. Dogs are also very important for the Sanufo, especially hunting dogs like these on which they place a liana collar to protect them from possible attacks by vermin in the forest. On important occasions as a substitute for the human sacrifices of the past, 
dogs' throats are cut and they are offered to the poro deities in the fetish houses. Every year, they must add a new layer of straw to these houses. The fetishes must be well protected. This is the main square of the village where we will find the house of the judges and the house of death, where dead bodies are taken for funeral rites to be performed. Between the fetish house and the house of judges stand the stones of truth. Here, prisoners sit in order to be publicly interrogated and sentenced. The Sinufo also have one of the richest craft traditions in Africa. On their looms, they continue to weave cloth as they have always done. The technique of these artisans has remained entirely unchanged. Every day, they weave long strips of cloth, which will later be joined together to make cotton canopies for a number of different uses. The swift hands of the men move with the skill that can only be acquired over time, placing the threads of different colors which make up each intricate design. From father to son to grandson, the art of weaving has been handed down since time immemorial. Sinufo painting is also among the most widely recognized in Africa. Picasso came here seeking inspiration for cubism from these artists who express the visions of the hunters or the deities of the Poro. They use vegetable paints made using techniques whose origins are lost in the depths of time. There are three main colors, red, ochre, and black, which only stains the canvas if it is applied over the ochre. It is spread without ever tarnishing the white, as if by magic. It could be no other way here in Africa. They make no preliminary sketches, but trace the designs directly with rudimentary iron implements. Freehand, they draw all types of designs with delicate strokes on their rough cotton cloth, and never making even the slightest mistake. These canopies are a synthesis of Senufo cosmogony. They depict the deities and scenes from the Poro, like this one showing the Boloi, the dance of the panther. Boloi is a symbolic representation of the Poro, showing the military training of its members. The movements are inspired by those of the panther, the sacred animal of the Senufo. Initiation into the Poro is obligatory and lasts for seven years. During this time, the wises transmit the knowledge of the society to the young men through words and symbols. All those who complete their initiation at the same time are said to belong to the same Kolobele, and this will be a bond which unites them for the rest of their lives. 
In the public dances, each dancer represents a different colobele and challenges the others by performing steps and acrobatic movements demonstrating his training and skill. They believe in a single god called Kolo Tiolu, which gave life to the first human couple. This couple had twins, which were the first human beings born of man, and the Sanufo are descended from these. Between God and men, they are the spirits of the ancestors and those of deities such as the Python, the messenger from the other world. The Poro was created in order to defend themselves from enemies and outside influences. Little by little it gained strength and became one of the most complex life philosophies in black Africa. In modern times, the Poro has proven able to resist both Islam and Christianity and has preserved the Sanufo culture almost intact. Its social content creates a bond and feeling of brotherhood among its members. From the time they begin their initiation, the young men perform agricultural work for the Poro in the so-called fields of the nobles, distributed among the oldest members and intended to meet the needs of the community. The Sinufo have traditionally worked the iron they extract by means of underground shafts. Near the city of Korogo, we find a mining region which the ironsmiths still use. The oldest people tell us that in the past iron could be found on the surface, but a curse was cast and the spirits concealed it beneath the ground. Now the miners have to descend down these narrow cavities, literally risking their lives, especially during the rainy season. Many are buried alive when the walls soften and cave in on them. Go <laughs> The soil they extract from the shafts is washed in the river to separate out the heavier ferrous stone. Then at the blacksmiths, the furnace master forms small balls with the paste resulting from the washing process. These are then introduced into the furnace so the iron melts and runs free from the other elements. They block the lower nozzle of the furnace with soil to increase the temperature. Two adobe cylinders ensure enough air enters to keep the fire going. Through the chimney, they introduce the ferrous stone and the charcoal, which will provide the necessary heat to melt the iron. The blacksmith have a high status in Sinopho society. Their work has always been extremely important for the community. 
those who had good blacksmiths possessed the best weapons in battle, and this made them superior to their rivals. Now, thanks to the tools they forged, the people are able to work the land. The forge master controls the pace of work, when they should stop, and the rhythm of the bellows, so that the heat is precisely that needed by each piece at each moment. They are holy men who work under the protection of the powerful fire fetish. Just like the men who perform the dance of fire, the purifying element which wards off evil and attracts the benefactor spirits of the poddle. Sanufo, the influence of Islam can immediately be felt. The most beautiful mosque in the Ivory Coast is that of Qom. It was built by a Malinke chief, Samori Toure. Its architecture combines elements from the north of Africa with other local ones. The buildings are made of mud and held up by wooden beams. The interior is home to strange creatures. Among the trunks which support the roof peacefully hang thousands of bats. For the Muslim inhabitants of Kong, they are sacred. These small mammals, despite their sinister appearance, are beneficial to man as they feed on mosquitoes. The worst thing is their smell, which the Muslim worshippers of Kong have to put up with each Friday when they come to the mosque. Originating in Burkina Faso, the Lobbies and the Bilfo have settled in the northeast of the country. Until recently, they were hunters, but are now sedentary. They form villages with no definite structure, rather archaic, scattered around the interior of the wooded savanna. Their houses, called Sukalas, are very unusual buildings, totally different from those of the other ethnic groups of the Ivory Coast. They are built with adobe. Thick wooden pillars hold up the upper floor, which is a flat rooftop. They are of different sizes, depending on the number of members in the family. The rooftop is used to dry the millet and the maize. The lobby are one of the least developed ethnic groups in West Africa. Many women still today wear the traditional decoration, two white stones inserted into their lips. On the ground floor of the Sukalas, they keep their cattle and household utensils. The rooms are large, including the kitchen, which has a small courtyard through which the smoke from the fire escapes. It is normal for three generations to live in each sukala. A narrow opening in one of the walls of the kitchen leads into the family sanctuary. Here they keep the fetishes of their ancestors. 
A film crew was shooting in this Bufo village when something unexpected and tragic occurred. The people ran to a nearby Sukala. The women let out heart-rending screams and within moments weeping could be heard right through the village. We soon found out what was happening. A ten-year-old child had just died from malaria. The pain of these people broke our hearts. The women raised their hands to the sky and between sobs muttered prayers. Then they shouted out the name of God with the same familiarity they would speak to someone close by, someone who was with them in their profound pain. And then, as always in Africa, the music sounded out, the tom-tom could be heard. Everyone got up. Undoubtedly, they had been expecting it. We felt moved and tense. These people so far removed from our world had just drawn us into their lives, made us one of them, and we shared their suffering. The sound of the drums brought us out of our days, and we began to see the real Africa with its greatness and misery, the human Africa that speaks through the sonar of the tom-tom and is capable of dancing even as they cry. For these people, death has a different meaning than for us. The deceased becomes part of a parallel and intimately close world. But they have to realize that they have died. They have to leave, no longer bother the living, and hence the cries and the music. illness has a religious dimension. When they fall ill, they believe something evil has invaded them and caused their particular ailment. Whatever it may be, the origin must lie in a spell, and so they turn to the healers, the traditional medicine. The Unyi fetish women are the most famous healers in the Ivory Coast. By invoking their spirit friends, they are capable of driving out the illness from those who have been victim of some spell. The truth is, they do give spiritual tranquility to a patient who, example, has malaria and believes that the mosquito that brought the disease was sent by someone wanting to harm him. The sad thing is, if the patient is not given quinine, he will die, even if the devil himself has been forced to flee. This is Africa. And that is how it will continue to be, with its wisdom and its apparent absurdities, but also with its mysterious magic, which will continue to fascinate us.